Let's look ahead to Saturday. It's a busy day in the NBA. There are 11 games on. We try and give some streaming options, some injury updates, but there's still chaos around the league. So, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name in Josh... Oh, it's not in Josh Lloyd. My name is Josh Lloyd and countries in Europe don't have as many differences between them as states do in the USA. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com, and you can find me on Twitter as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free, and we are available on all platforms. Go and be a double banger. After the busyness of the trade deadline, I'm sure you're ready to bang once and bang twice. Go listen to the audio, watch the video, thumb it up, and leave a comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell. We wanted to get 20,000 people watching the live show yesterday. We are currently sitting, I think it's 36,000. So smashed it, which was awesome. Uh, we didn't get 20,000 in there all at once, which I wanted, but that's okay. We got over, we, yeah, we almost doubled the overall total goal. So thank you to everyone who was a part of the live show. Um, it was awesome to have you guys in there as stuff was going down. Plus, you know, looking at all the recap shows we did afterwards as well. And we are, like I said yesterday many times, the trade deadline's not a one day thing in terms of fantasy because it evolves. We get, the trade deadline and we form our immediate opinions. And then we get the situation that happens straight after the deadline where players step up and you go, oh, wow, I'm going to jump on this guy massively because there's you know seven guys out of that team that might be in the rotation and we don't really know how that goes. And then we've got to be really cautious. We don't overreact to big performances from players that we want to do well. And there's an inet, in, uh, innate sort of feeling inside us as fantasy managers that we say, well, look at this rookie. Look what he did. It's the corner turned. He's in a big role. This team's terrible. He's going to do this every night. And I'll give you two names that were like that yesterday. One was G.G. Jackson. One was Marcus Sasser. Um, so we think, well, that's just what's going to happen. But then things settle down and coaches do things differently and random injuries pop up and the traded players arrive and the role gets cut back. And there's a whole bunch of things that happen. So I'm not saying we don't get excited or anything like that. It's more about be really cautious, especially if you're doing fantasy trades around this time, that you don't look at what happens over the next two to three days and think, well, that is what's going to happen all season and making an overvaluation play on someone who stepped up because seven guys are out on their team and eight players are out on the opposition. That can be a, that can be a trap. So just be cautious with that. In terms of traded players arriving, we're previewing Saturday's action here. I think that the vast majority of those players will be available for Saturday's game, but I don't know. We're already seeing some be available for Friday and some being ruled out for Friday. For example, Buddy Heald, even though last night he was ruled out for the Sixers, he's actually available to play for the Sixers today. Same with Campaign. All the Hornets guys have been ruled out for Friday's game, but maybe they're available for Saturday. And you know, dodgy, shifty injury reporting is going to be a relative norm across there as well. We've got 11 games on on Saturday, so let's go ahead. That was the wrong That was the wrong uh, graphic. I don't know why that correct graphic didn't show up, but oh well, we'll figure that out later. Um, let's take a look at what we need to take a look at right now. That was bothering me, that graphic, so I went to fix it, so that should be better. Yes, there you go. Look ahead for Saturday, February the 10th. All right, let's talk about what we know injury-wise. I'm not going to include any of the traded players in this injury report because there's way too many of them, and again, there's no real update on them. We're just expecting that they're ready for Saturday. And I think yeah, 95% of the cases, they will be available. So in terms of who is out through injury, Derek Lively's out with his nose fracture. Quentin Grimes is still out with a knee problem. Cam Johnson's out with his groin issue. I am just going to go out on a limb and say that LaMelo Ball's not going to play because this idiot franchise, by the way, they gave an update on Mark Williams. So yeah, look, at least another four weeks. How did you list this man doubtful? for 14 games in a row through the middle of November. I think it was. Also remember, he came back and played a game after being out for three games. He came back and played, and then he was out doubtful after that every game. And now I think he's done for the season, Mark Williams. I think you can move on from him. Like, there's no, he's just not coming back. Like, reevaluated another four weeks. 
It takes us through to the sort of start middle of March. So, you know, around the 10th of March. And then you've got under four weeks to go in the season. I don't think he's coming back. They claim he's going to come back. He's not coming back. As for Lamello, I've got no idea. Again, soreness. What does that mean? What is it? If, if we get out of the All-Star break and Lamello ball pops up on the injury report after the All-Star break, he's done. Like, how much more rest do you need? Uh, and again, I think it's garbage what this team is doing. Jake LaRavia, I believe, is going to be out in Memphis. I think Tari Eason will remain out in Houston, but no update on that fully. Chris Paul and Gary Payton should be out for the Warriors. No no real uh, query there. Clint Capella will be out for the Hawks. I think that Trey Murphy is going to sit. It is a back-to-back for them. Remember, last time they had this Friday, Saturday back-to-back, they didn't list Trey Murphy on the injury report for the second game, and then he didn't play, and they got fined. So I would expect Trey Murphy to appear in the injury report for Saturday and appear to be listed out. Nick Batum and DeAnthony Melton, they've been ruled out for Friday. I'm just going to guess, considering they haven't given us any sort of positive update, that they'll be available for Saturday. I'm just going to guess that they're not available for Saturday. And this, the Sixers are clo- quickly climbing up my list of terrible injury reporting teams because this Batum thing's been going on for you know over a week. Like, just say he hurt his hamstring grade one, he's out two weeks. Like, that's very easy. The Melton thing with his back, like, what's actually going on here? We're getting any update on this. It's really frustrating for us to try and deal with this from a fantasy perspective, but also from a fan perspective as well. Just the constant, we don't know who's in or out every single day when the team definitely does. They've got a bunch of injuries that we just don't know about, unfortunately. Dante Exum, I don't even know if he's going to be a part of the rotation uh, in a huge way. I I do think that um, Josh Green's very clearly going to be starting there. Isaiah Joe uh, for the Thunder is going to be questionable. Lonnie Walker, I'm putting as questionable, but I I would say there's no chance that he plays. Uh, Daron Sharp um, returning from his knee issue, maybe, but we haven't had a real update there. I'm going to put Luke Kennard and Zaire Williams as questionable, but honestly, if you could throw 10 different Grizzlies guys on the injury report, I wouldn't be shocked. Watch for Jackson, watch for Aldama, watch for Conchar, watch for Vince Williams, anyone. There could be a million, every Grizzlies player might appear, and this is going to be the Grizzlies shuffle all season, and we have no idea how to sort of plan for it, making it almost impossible, even to roster. Like, we're rostering Vince, obviously. We're rostering Jaron, but might be impossible for you to roster uh, Greg Jackson, you know, Trey Jemison, who'll be on it. Like, it's just it's Scotty Pippen. And yesterday, someone corrected me because I said, why are they bumping Scotty back and forward? Because I was under the impression, incorrectly, that if you have a two-way, you've got 50 games. And that is true if you sign to the two-way before the start of the season. If you sign the two-way middle of the season, they prorate your game's limit. Now, I wasn't going to go in and do the calculation because it's like you've got to divide the number of days that have elapsed in the NBA season. So it's suffice to say that with about 30-odd games left in the season, Scotty Pippen's two-way doesn't account for those 30 days. He's probably got like 20 games, which again is a pretty silly rule on that two-way. But that's why he's like starting one game and then going to the G League and then starting the next game and going to the G League. So if you can guess the right day or if you've got stash ability, then yeah, Pippen's really good. Like he's a 12-team league guy in those starts. The problem is, is that the back and forward of going through the uh, the motions and what they did do actually sign Trey Jemison to the two way, and he's now going to be limited to that same sort of restriction. So while Jemison's going to have value, like just watch those games where they do announce that he is in and starting, and then he's useful in that spot, the same as Pippen because they converted Greg Jackson to a full time contract. So yeah, the Grizzlies, uh, who knows. Tyrese Maxey's questionable still for Friday's game with an illness, um, so we'll see about him for Saturday. Marvin Bagley's out on Friday, so I'm going to put him as questionable for Saturday. DeAndre Hunter is probable for Friday. I'll put him questionable in the back-to-back for Saturday. DeJounte Murray with his... um, Now, I I thought for sure DeJounte Murray was getting traded, and and I did think that DeAndre Russell was getting traded, and they were wrong, both of them, obviously. Um, But it also goes to show that when someone appears on the injury report and you think it's because of a trade, it isn't. Didn't happen for DeJounte, obviously. I guess you could make the argument that Boyan Bogdanovic sitting out on the fir- on the back-to-back was a fake injury because he was being traded. I really don't buy that at all, but that does line up, so I will give you that one. DeJounte still questionable with his back issue. Jalen Smith, I think, is going to be perpetually listed on the injury report with a back issue. He played last game and left after 13 minutes. Uh, the burner, Jalen Brunson, with his ankle. That ankle didn't look great, so I wouldn't be shocked if Brunson misses. And, of course, if he does, we're full-on eating up uh, Juice McBride here. Isaiah Hartenstein left the last game early with his Achilles issue. No real update on that. I think he's at risk of sitting. Um, Clay Thompson missed the last game with illness. Devin Booker missed the last game. I think they'll be okay. Valanchunas is questionable for Friday. So we need to see whether he's going to be available with a calf contusion. I don't think that Zion will play on Friday, but he might. 
And if he does, then he won't play Saturday. So I'm going to list him sort of questionable here. Najee Marshall still officially questionable for Friday's game. DeAndre Ayton, Malcolm Brogdon, Scooter Henderson, Dwop Reith. All, uh, all missed last game for the Blazers. And then Anthony Simons got hurt in that game. So that is uh, five key rotation players who we don't have really any idea what's going to happen. So those other guys in that game, like you might be firing up an Ashton Hagens in that one. Literally. Yeah, Chris Murray. You won't do, be doing Ryan Rupert because he's not playing in those minutes, but like Jabari Walker, big value maybe. Cody Martin is listed probable for Friday. I'm going to put him as a question mark as questionable for Saturday just because it's a back-to-back. Um, but there's a lot of unknowns. There's a ton of unknowns with this uh, this injury report currently. Um, the only team that's got a Saturday-Sunday back-to-back is the Thunder, and we got an update from them on Gordon Haywood. Haywood will be out until after the All-Star break. Remember, the Charlotte Hornet um, elite-level medical reporting team did upgrade him to questionable two days ago. So he'd been out the whole time with no updates. And they went, oh yeah, you're actually questionable. Upgrade him to questionable, traded him. He got to the Thunder. They went, absolutely not. What are we doing here? You're not playing for two weeks, my guy. You're not ready to play. So like, is that the Thunder being extra cautious? Maybe. Is that the Hornets medical reporting being dreadful? I sort of know which way I'm going to lean on that. I guess you can figure out which way I'm going to lean on that. But yeah. Hayward won't play until after the All-Star break. I don't think Gordon Hayward is going to be a must-roster 12-team league player. After the trade, he'll have moments for sure, but he doesn't walk into a 32-minute-a-night role easily, comfortably, straight away. He might get that some nights. He'll be solid enough, but not, especially now that he's hurt as well. Uh, Not a guy that we have to uh, go and grab 100%. Today's episode... He's brought to you by our partners over at eBay Motors. eBay Motors have teamed up with me to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week, all season long. Whether whether you're prepping for daily stuff, whether you're looking to scour the waiver wire to get the right players in, we're going to get you guys that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. The uh, trade deadline opens up a lot of stuff. And what we saw first game yesterday for the Jazz was Taylor Hendricks was bang straight into the rotation. He only played 18 minutes. He blocked a shot. He had some rebounds. He didn't shoot very well. But those 18 minutes are very interesting. The Jazz are clearly not competing for this year. They traded away all their small forwards. And when weird injuries start to crop up for John Collins and for Larry Markinen, I can see an extended run of Taylor Hendricks and Walker Kessler starting together and Hendricks being a fantasy option. He's more of a guy to watch at the moment, a guy to be able to stash, but just... Just watch where this goes, because I do think there's a big opportunity coming up for Taylor Hendricks. He might not be a guaranteed fit on your roster right now, but I think he will once we head into March. The same with your vehicle, eBay Motors knows. The championship team is about each player being that perfect fit. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure that your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever it is your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Like if I had access to eBay Motors here, because eBay Guaranteed Fit's only available to US customers, I wouldn't still be waiting to get my car fixed from November last year because we're just waiting for the right parts to be here. Like it's just taking forever. And that's really frustrating. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to US customers, eligible items only, and exclusions apply. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the streams of the day, remembering that a lot can really change here. Um, I am going to list Amen Thompson as the 10-team category league stream of the day. Fred Van Vliet's going to be out, but I would be interested in putting Andre Drummond in that spot. I just don't know exactly what the minutes are going to be like. If he plays 30 minutes, Andre Drummond is the category league streamer of the day there, for sure. But I, if he plays 15 minutes, he's not. So I'm going to put a men there, and I'll put Precious Achua as the 12-team league guy with no OG Ananobi, maybe no Boyan Bogdanovich, maybe no Isaiah Hartenstein. Achua's got a pretty big role. In 14 teams, I'm going with Marcus Sasser. Now, that is because, obviously, they... Got rid of Killian Hayes. They, uh, In fact, what do they do to Killian Hayes? Get that garbage out of here! They don't have Quentin Grimes, who's injured. They moved off of Alec Burks. Um, they might get Fontecchio there, but there is still minutes here for Sasa. I do think that the minutes will sort of dissipate a little bit as the season goes on, and he won't play those 39 minutes, despite being a rookie, just because you have to incorporate Grimes and Fontecchio into that rotation. But for now, yeah. 16 team up, Cody Martin, who I expect will start. But is there a chance that he doesn't start and like someone like Trey Mann comes in and gets a crack straight away? I am so interested to see. I don't think Trey Mann's a very good player, but I think he can put up big numbers in an environment that allows him to do it. And I think that environment might allow him to do it. So let's see what they do with Mann. You know that I'm, I've am i been talking about him for a very... I actually stashed him in 30 deep. 
Like, and then as soon as the trade went down, someone sent me a trade. I said, hey, can I have a uh, trade man for Lester Canonas? I went, uh, no, you cannot. Not that I'm necessarily going to uh, be competing in that league, but yeah, having that trade man might actually give me a late push for the playoffs. My points league streams are going to be a Men Thompson for Yahoo and for ESPN. Again, if we knew more confidence about Andre Drummond, we would put him in that spot. So what's on my radar? Let's look at the first game. There are 11 games on. It is the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Dallas Mavericks, the first one. Early game, 3 p.m. Eastern. Be ready for your moves to come in early. I want to watch Josh Giddy because I think he's a drop. Now, Gordon Haywood arriving is going to make that even more of a reality. Now, you could hold Giddy through the All-Star break until Haywood actually arrives. But if Haywood's going to play 30 minutes a night, I think it's going to impact Dort and Giddy. But let's see. Maybe Giddy can shake stuff off. I, I don't know. In terms of the Mavericks, Josh Green has played well the last couple of games. I don't believe he's any more than a streamer or a 14-team league player. I don't have any level of consistency in usage or production across the board, but at the moment, he's playing well. Lou Dort is going to be the perpetual streamer for the Thunder. It's going to make me sad, but he is, and you're going to have a one-in-four chance of that being good. And then Green is the guy on Dallas who's widely available. The next game we look at is the Pistons and the Clippers. It is Marcus Sasser we're looking at. A lot of people are very, very frothy on this guy. They love him. I am not as high on him. He has been quite good in terms of shooting as a rookie. That is true. But I think more of I'm looking at it from his long-term perspective. He's a much older rookie. I believe someone, I saw someone say today he's the same age as Quentin Grimes. Um, he's short. And I don't really think he's a point guard. I don't think his vision's there. He also plays the same position as the Pistons' two best players in Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey. But with the absence of Grimes, he's getting a lot of minutes at the moment. So let's see what they continue to do. For the Clippers, Paul George. Is he still on that six minute less than Kawhi and Harden limit? Probably. And I think that'll probably last until the All-Star break. And don't be surprised if he barely plays in that game and then he's back to full strength afterwards. Fingers crossed. I don't know why these idiots won't just sit him out, but whatever. Probably because they're too scared of the media calling them you know, wimps and pussies for not playing. Honestly, like legit, I think that's a, it's, that's a part of it. In terms of streaming, Sass is the guy for Detroit and the cockroach in uh, LA, Mason Plumley. He's not a great option, but he has got that backup role over Daniel Tice. The Spurs and the Nets, Jeremy Sohan has dropped off a little bit recently. I, I think that puts him on the fringe of 12s. And if you wanted to make a switch, hey, I'm going to try out Sasa. I'm just going to keep mentioning Sasa, A, because he's in the thumbnail, but B, he had a huge game yesterday, so he's on everyone's mind. If you wanted to drop Sohan to see what happens with Sasa, go for it. Like that's about, when we talk about getting out ahead of something, like I might not believe in Sasa being this huge 33-minute-a-night player rest of season, because again, I, I play the 240 game. And I go, well, how does he do that if they've got a four-guard rotation and he's the fourth? Or you could say that he's the third. Or you could say that Grimes plays the three, but I'm not sure that he does. But it doesn't matter because they might find a way and they just say, well, even though we traded stuff to get Fontecchio, we're going to play him 20 minutes. Or we're not going to run any other threes apart from Fontecchio and Cade is going to be our yeah, nominal three. That's possible as well. So getting out ahead of it for a guy where the upside of Sohan is like, it's limited, it's okay. For the Nets, Simmons, Benny. Again, there is so much confusion across many areas. Fantasy analysts, whether in written form, podcast form, YouTube form, um, NBA analysts, about what happens with a deadline and who comes in. There'll be people who come out and tell you, well, Dennis Schroeder's going to come in and play 34 minutes and get a great bump in value and be an awesome must roster player for fantasy, or he's going to be guiding the team. And there'll be others be like me who say, no. Ben Simmons is going to be their starting point guard. Uh, Dinwiddie's minutes were on the way down and Schroeder maybe takes those and then him and Dennis Smith sort of fight for backup minutes. That's how I see it. But we don't know how it's going to pay play out. So I want to see what they do with Simmons. How long does this 20-minute limit last? What does his actual max ceiling look like? Or do they start Schroeder and Simmons together? Highly doubt it. And what do they do with the absence of Finney Smith and Johnson? There are still so many variables. Another one of these ones where even in this first game, maybe Dennis Schroeder comes in and plays 32 minutes because there's no Johnson, there's no Walker, there's no Finney Smith. And then we get over-indexed on it and get excited about it, and then he plays 18 minutes a night after the break. Yeah, it's possible too. But yeah, what I'm talking about here is watching Simmons, who is just doing Simmons stuff, taking no shots, but getting rebounds and assists. For the streams, probably bubble champagne. For the San Antonio, no Doug McDermott. We'll see how his minutes get impacted. And then uh, I like Dennis Smith as a stream in Brooklyn. Um, his ability to generate those defensive stats is huge. And his value will rise significantly if Schroeder is not available to play. But of course, we don't know that at this point. I do expect Dennis will be there. Memphis and Charlotte. Of course, we want to watch Greg Jackson the second, a new four-year deal. People have asked this question. Does this new contract for Greg Jackson mean he's going to have a regular 
30 minute a night role each night. And I will say no. I'll say no. They were, the, the, the decision to give Greg Jackson the contract was not because he scored 27 points last game. This has been on the cards for weeks and weeks and weeks. They just needed to make all of their moves at the deadline, make their transactions in order to square things up, get the roster spot available, which they did. They waived Chemezi Metu to do that, and they converted him. Does that mean that he will play those big minutes every night? That's hard to say. If Jaron and Santi are available and Vince Williams is there, well, no, he's not going to start. He's not going to play 32 minutes a night. I would guess every night. But it is also it is possible. Because last game, he did. He was great. He's hard to trust from an efficiency standpoint. Go look at his steal, block, and assist numbers. They're all like at under one per game in 24 minutes or whatever it is. They're very low. He's a better points lead than category league play, but it is worth a fly. Again, I'm just not sure he's going to lock in at 35 a night and be a con- well and be a consistent top 100 player. In terms of streams, Santi Aldama's there. He still remains incredibly mid to me with very low fantasy upside. Just another one of those players that I just disagree with on people. I just think his fantasy profile is not super exciting. I do think he's okay to have. I just don't think that he's just a game changer. And then for the Hornets, probably Cody Martin is the stream, but just watch Trey Mann. Especially if Martin and Ball are out, just watch Trey Mann. I mean, you watch him and you go, what am I doing watching this guy? This is annoying. But think like... He sometimes can play a bit like Cam Thomas. Not as ball hoggy, but he does have that sort of explosive scoring. Chicago and Orlando. It's all about Andre Drummond. That's what we want to watch in Chicago. Is he going to start or is he going to play 30 off the bench? Or does matching up against Bunkero and Franz Wagner at the four instead of you know slow-footed seven-footers like Towns and Aldama last game, does that mean that he can't play? Like, how how much of a chance does Himmel Vooch have if they're out there guarding Bunkera? I'll say very, very little. But if they pump 30 minutes into Drummond in this matchup, well, then I'm officially intrigued. And then we want to watch Wendell Carter Jr., who had this run of playing 35 minutes a night. Now we're back to 28. That puts him on the fringes of 12s. In terms of streams, there's not much there for the Bulls. It is probably Drummond, but I'm using a 39% rostered cutoff here, so he's above that. So Tory Craig or John Isaac for the magic side of things if we're looking to stream somebody in over there. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be just around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. Introducing the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class-exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone, Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store. They're built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. You can also find in their lineup the 2024 Nissan Armada. It'll change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. You can tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Okay, um, let's look at the next one. It is Philadelphia and Washington. Both of these teams are on a back-to-back Friday through Saturday. We're going to see Buddy Heald play. But again, that's one of those ones where you'll see Buddy Heald and you might see him, I think, play a ton. But it could also be a situation that he's playing a ton because Batum is out, Melton is out, Maxi might be either out or under the weather as well. And Kyle Lowry hasn't joined the team. So be wary of it. Right? Lowry is going to join the team. So Lowry will be in the rotation. But at the moment, there's no one there. You're going to have Terquavion Smith playing 20 minutes and Ricky Council playing 20 minutes, perhaps. For the um, wizard side of things, um, it's all about center because Rashawn Holmes is not available Friday, neither is Bagley. So they're going to be rolling with Eugene Omaruyi at center, most likely. And that might hold again for Saturday. Or you might have both Holmes and Bagley or just Holmes and no Bagley making Holmes a great ad for that day. I don't think that Holmes will be a 12-team league player, but again... Differing people have differing opinions. They think that Holmes will play over Bagley, and I don't, but we don't know. So we need to watch all that stuff. In terms of streams, Muhammad Bamba in Philadelphia. I said this yesterday. I think the trade deadline helped Paul Reed immensely, but we get another opportunity for you to tell me how bad and and wrong, or how bad Paul Reed is and how bad I am for recommending Paul Reed as an ad. So we get another couple of opportunities coming up here. And for the Wizards, Bagley would be the ideal stream if we know he's available. Otherwise, we go to Holmes. Otherwise, we go to Amaroy. I can't believe how many times I've had to say Eugene Amaroy today. 
Houston and Atlanta, back-to-backs for both of these squads as well. Um, no Fred Van Vliet for Houston, no Capella for Atlanta, not sure about DeAndre Hunter, not sure about DeJounte Murray. Amen Thompson's the clear stream in Houston. He's going to have some issues with percentages, we know, but he's just bloody fun, and I cannot wait for him to fully grow into his uh, game. For the Hawks, yeah, it's uh, lob threat legend Bruno Fernando if you're looking for some blocks and field goal percentage in deeper leagues because we know they do not run deep at all. Indiana and the Knicks is the next game. I want Tyrese Halliburton. He's on my radar because what's going on? When are we getting the full minutes? He was weirdly inactive yesterday. There's a huge buy low chance here for Halliburton at the moment where I don't even, I don't think you have to give up a top 15 player at them. You might, you might, but I don't know that you do. So I'd be very interested in doing that. For the Knicks, Josh Hart had a big triple-double last game. Let's see if Boyan Bogdanovich plays, What the and Balik Burks. If he plays, like what does that do for, for Hart? How does that all fit in? In terms of streams, Andrew Nempard continues to start. Maybe we stream him. Maybe we stream Matherin, who's highly rostered. I don't think either are 12-team league guys, though. Achua is available, and he shouldn't be, with so much uncertainty around players. But I am fairly confident that he will become a drop soon. Cleveland and Toronto, the winner soldier is a is a big jack candidate. Get that garbage out of here! And by candidate, he just dropped Max Struess. That's fine. For Toronto, we want to watch the GOAT, RJ Barrett, who honestly, like, I know people, man, people have such an apology fetish. Someone yesterday went, man, can you apologize to Zach Collins? Like, no. What are you talking about? Why would I do that? What the hell? We, why do you have such an apology fetish? But anyway, I will tell you this. RJ Barrett has played significantly better in Toronto. He looks much better. His rebound rate is improved. His assist rate is better. He steals and blocks, still putrid. His free throw is still bad. His three-pointer is still not reliable. But he's been able to increase his two-point rate at a huge rate. He's finishing at the rim way up. Excuse me if I have skepticism that the 300 games prior are a little bit more um, descriptive than 14 games in Toronto. But he's been awesome. And you know what? There's going to be a period of time where eventually, if it continues, I'll just be like, okay, well, I guess he's just changed and become a super efficient two-point guy. I'm not willing to do that yet because years and years and years of data, not for RJ, but for just players in general, would suggest you don't want to make sweeping changes based on 14 games. And that is, I don't hate RJ as a player. I think he's been overrated as a player and he's been a pretty negative fantasy producer throughout his career. And I'm just, I'm not going to be making switches like that on a player's overall stat profile. That is the thing about RJ. So he's been great. He's been awesome. He should be on rosters now. I'm just sort of waiting for a drop. Might not ever come. In terms of streams, we're going to Isaac Okoro in Cleveland. Not very good there. And then Gary Trent in Toronto. But Toronto's got, like, what happens? There's no Schroeder. So what happens? They wave Dinwiddie. So does that mean, I guess it means more Trent. It means more Brown, who's going to have to be their backup point guard. And I think Bruce Brown should probably be on a 12-team roster if he's going to be their backup point guard as well. And I think it means that we all get more Dick. I don't know whether Dick is going to be the 12-team guy, but I do think there will be an opportunity for that later in the season. So... As always, you just got to be on top of Dick. The Phoenix Suns and the Golden State Warriors. I couldn't believe how many questions I got yesterday as the trade went down to drop Grayson Allen. Can we maybe just wait to see how busted ass Royce O'Neal does in his games? Like, O'Neal's not very good. He's fine. His finishing numbers are in the toilet for two years in a row. But why he would be completely reducing Grayson Allen, I have no idea. And don't even get me started on David Roddy. So let's watch what Grayson Allen does, especially if Booker plays. For the Warriors, Pajemski started the last game with Clay out. But my, my more thing with him, more thing, that's not words. My most important thing with Pajemski is what do the minutes look like if Clay and Wiggins both play? If it's 26, he's probably not a must hold. If it's 32, then it probably is. And then we have the Chris Paul stuff coming later on. In terms of streams, Eric Gordon for Phoenix and Lester Quinones, who's getting some good minutes at the moment. Big Lester Quinones. Uh, he's, he's one of the uh, legendary short shorts guys as well, Lester. Love that. Pelicans Blazers. This is the last game of the, the day. We, it's a back-to-back for New Orleans. I'm going to guess that Zion and Trey sit one of these games. I think Trey definitely out on Saturday. Zion probably out on Friday. For the Blazers, well, just way too many things that are up in the air. Last game, it was awesome. Jabari Walker put up big numbers without Aiton, without Reith, without Scoot, without Brogdon, and without half of Simon. So uh, excuse me, even though I am one of the preeminent Jabari Walker pushers, if I don't get too excited about that game. In terms of streams, Larry Nance, especially if Valanchunas is out. And then Matisse Thibault's minutes are up because there's just a million guys that could be in or out. And Thibault had, what, five steals, two blocks last game? That's useful. In terms of chunks, we're going Saturday through to Wednesday next week. This is a very busy period of the schedule. 11 games Saturday, 10 games Monday, an insane 13 games Wednesday. 
So what this does is it means that our streaming days are Sunday and Tuesday. And there are a couple of teams that do have that combination. One of them is the Sacramento Kings and the Pencil Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. So you get the Sunday, Tuesday, low volume back-to-back, and then he plays on Wednesday. The Thunder and Lou Dort, they're the only team with the Saturday-Sunday combination. Now, you might be able to stream on a 10-game Monday. You might be able to stream on an 11-game Saturday. A 13-game Wednesday, probably not. So Dort plays the Saturday-Sunday and then the Tuesday as well. The Miami Heat, so Josh Richardson, Jaime Jaquez, and okay, people who are Mexican or have a uh, a, a Spanish-speaking background, is it Jaquez or Jaquez? Jaquez or Jaquez? I don't even know how you would write out which one it is. Is it number one, Jaquez, or number two, Jaquez? Anyway, Richardson, Jaquez, and Caleb Martin all have the Sunday, Tuesday, low-volume combo, plus they play on Wednesday, and their minutes are all going to be 20, 25 plus, I would guess. And then Aaron Wiggins got the Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday combination there. No one has five games in eight nights because, again, Saturday next week is the beginning of the All-Star break, so we don't count that one. Ten-team streams. Andre Drummond at the top there, but you know level of uncertainty. We go to a Men Thompson, uh, Big Dick Nick Richards. There's No one is coming for his minutes. They shipped off PJ. Unless you're going to see Grant Williams playing a ton of center, it's going to be Nick Richards and the genius Nate Mensah playing those minutes. Uh, Nick Richards, again, I know I talk about why is he under-rostered. He's not a great points league guy, but if you're in a points league, you can actually just see what his fantasy points are and how that makes sense versus who's on your waiver wire in your specific scoring system. You know what I don't know? What your specific scoring system is. So if you come and tell me, hey, Nick Richards only gets 20 a game and I've got guys on my wire averaging 25, then you know what? He's not a must-roster player. But I have to talk in more generalities and that's how we talk about Nick. He's a must-roster category league player to me. But also, if you're punting field goals and blocks, you've got no use for him. And with every player that I talk about, I can't give you every single... I can't say every little... Well, he's actually... He's a guy you want to roster, but or should be rostered by somebody, but not if unless this and this and this and this and this and this and this. It's very hard to dilute that. And if I did that for every player, well, I'd actually talk for way longer than I already do. Paul Reed's a 10-team streamer. Just He should be on a roster as well. Kelly Oubre... I'll be very... I think he's got no chance of having value when Buddy healed and this team gets full again. But we'll see. And then Marvin Bagley would be great if we knew he was going to play. 12 teamers. We're going to go with Sasa. We're going to go with the big sneeze, Precious Achua, Santi Aldama, Kelly Olinick, if he's available. His minutes again. Does he? Is he solely a backup behind Pirtle? There are some that thinks he will start over Pirtle because they gave up a first round pick. There are some, like me, who think maybe he starts at the four and Gary Trent moves to the bench. Or he plays 26 minutes a night backing up the four and the five. His role is all over the shop. I don't know what the Raptors are doing as a standard comment. Maybe that's on my commandment tablet, but the link's worth looking at. I've got Johnny Conchar and Andrew Nempard. I don't feel particularly good about those ones, especially the Grizzlies guys. The deep league guys, we're going to Mo Bamba. We're going to John Isaac. Obviously, we're streaming those guys for defensive stats. You've got Timothy John for assists. That's McConnell. You've got the Duck Luke Kennard, if he plays. Larry Nance and Cody Martin, who actually might jump up even further. And then you can put Trey Mann into that mix as well, um, depending on you know, if he... If he plays, he's available. When Cody plays and Lamelo plays, all that stuff. Points League streams, we're going to go to Amen Thompson. We're going to go to Marvin Bagley, Santi Aldama, Precious Achua, Marcus Sasser, and Gregory Jackson II. And guys, that will do it for me today. Be sure to stay tuned to the news to see exactly what goes on with who's in, who's out, who's available, trades, rotations. And remember, the rotations that happen Friday and Saturday and Sunday are not indicative of what's going to happen in a week's time or two weeks' time or three weeks' time. There is going to be a lot of shuffling. Be careful of overvaluing, undervaluing, over-indexing on trades, whatever. Be really cautious because a lot of the stuff here will be weird for a game or two and then it will change and then it will change again. That is how I view it. How it changes, I don't know. But we'll find out. Guys, don't go ahead, give that thumbs up, ring the bell, leave your comments. All of that stuff is a great way of helping out the show. And again, thank you again for everyone's interaction with the trade deadline stuff yesterday. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.